11, verse 35. The Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 35. Uh, now, remember, this is last uh, Wednesday night. We dealt with, uh, we've dealt with John 10 for several Wednesdays, several different aspects of John 10. <clears throat> and so tonight, this is where we're supposed to be. I think you're going to see, and I really had not given thought to what was next in the Gospel of John uh, when Sunday morning rolled around. Uh, but tonight you're going to see maybe a little similarity there uh, between uh, what we preach Sunday morning and some truths that we'll find in John chapter 11. And what I'm trying to say is, is that, you know, I can't line this up, that God, the Lord's got us in the gospel of John, uh, and uh, he, we roll around to John chapter 11, uh, the Lord knew what he was going to do Sunday, and here we are tonight in John 11, kind of maybe touching on just some of this, just a similar theme, and that's obviously uh, for me and for you. It's for a purpose. God is, is, uh, is still doing a continued work through Sunday service, uh, and, uh, and so this Wednesday night, when we're just where we're supposed to be at next, it's not just coincidence. The Lord knew when we started the Gospel of John months ago that this is where we would be at today. And so uh, this is where we're at, and we're just going to just let the Lord speak to us through John chapter 11. But if you will, stand with us in reverence and honor to the reading of God's Word, John chapter 11, verse 35. Jesus wept. You may be seated. <laughs> Samantha, you can sit down now. That was two words, the shortest verse in the Bible. <laughs> John chapter 11. May God add the blessings to the reading uh, of his... <laughs> Listen, college kids are laughing up here. You could laugh too, you know. I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, the shortest verse in all of our King James Bible, Jesus wept. And so you know the surrounding story uh, about uh, this text. Uh, this is the... John chapter 11 is filled entirely with the story of the death of Lazarus. Now... Let me say some things. We're thinking tonight about our journey of faith uh, because that's kind of what we're on. When we uh, are saved and give our life to Jesus, uh, he then begins to lead us on this journey of faith. And it is a journey, by the way. Uh, sometimes on journeys, there are obstacles. Uh, sometimes uh, on journeys, the travel gets hot. Sometimes it may get cold. Sometimes there's flat tires. Sometimes there's, uh, there, there, there's uh, unexpected stops along the way. Uh, I remember one time, for those of my friends that are watching online tonight, I remember one time when I was a kid, way back up in the mountains, there was a place we used to go four-wheeling at, a place called Dark Ridge, and, and a pretty rough old mountain road, and you, you could go in there, and I mean, it was, it was bona fide four-wheeling in the mountains. And right at the very end, the road makes this, uh, this loop. Uh, you can either go straight and go off through this big deep hole uh, and come out the other side and make the loop and head back out, or you could just go to the right and just avoid that last hole. And I was about 17 at the time, I guess, had a, had a Ford F-150, and we, we drove in there that one evening just right at dark, four-wheeling, and... and uh, expecting to turn around and come back out and you're several miles back in the mountains. And we come to that last hole and I stopped and looked at it because it's all water. It's all muddy water and you can't tell what's there. Well, my buddy had been in there and he looks at me and he said, no, this is the last hole. Uh, he said, uh, most people get stuck in it. Nobody ever goes through it. Uh, but uh, you can just go to the right and we'll go around it. And I said, but some people do go through it, right? And, and he said, yeah, but most people go to the right and they go around it. And, of course, being 17, you know how all that goes. Uh, I revved the motor up and uh, dropped it in second gear and took off. And, and, man, we went off in that thing and we just sat down in a big, just a big hole. The, the mud come up to my windshield. It was coming in the doors, the water. Uh, there was no getting out. I mean, we were stuck and ended up having to walk about those three miles out, and it was dark before we got out. Didn't have flashlights, didn't have anything, uh, and, uh, and had to leave my truck stuck down in that, uh, that big hole. Uh, and so that was certainly not expected. And that's the thing about life and this journey of faith, these things that happen that we don't expect. 
Uh, we, uh, we, we must remember that when we get saved and give our life to the Lord, that, uh, that that's, that's not the end destination. That's not the end goal. That's just the beginning of a journey of faith that has ups and downs and highs and lows and struggles and blessings, and sometimes all of those come at the same time. Often, I used to say uh, that uh, it's possible to have a struggle on one hand and blessing in the other, uh, but I believe now, the longer I have lived, that sometimes blessing and struggle are even in the same hand at times. But the story of Lazarus, so you remember there's, there's Mary, Martha, and there's Lazarus. And, and Thomas is also mentioned in this text a couple of times. Uh, one of the only three times I think that he's mentioned, but he's always skeptical and he's always doubting, hence the name Doubting Thomas. And so he's doubting in this text. But Mary and Martha, and the name Lazarus, the Bible is very clear and it points out that Jesus loved them. Uh, he used to go to their house and eat. He hung out with them. This was like his... His, uh, this was his buddies. Uh, this was his homeboys, if you will. Uh, he went to Mary and Martha's house, and uh, you know the story of, of Mary and Martha, where Mary is at the feet of Jesus, and she's, uh, she's worshiping, but Martha, she's a busybody. So we see a picture of, uh, of one that is uh, devoted. We see Mary worshiping Jesus. She's devoted. We see another personality, her sister, uh, uh, who is, uh, she's distracted because she's running around trying to make things happen, trying to make things happen. And, uh, and what uh, happens in that text uh, early on is that the Lord makes it clear that, listen, I know what you're doing being busy is a good thing. Working for me is a good thing. Cooking for me is a good thing. Uh, but the better part is what your sister's doing, and that's just at my feet worshiping. Uh, and so we learn some lessons from all of that. But in this John 11 Mary and Martha and Lazarus is mentioned, the names are mentioned over and over and over and over all throughout this text. And it emphasizes the fact that this family was close to Jesus. He loved them. The Bible makes it clear in John 11. Go home and read this whole chapter. It's just one, one chapter, a little lengthy chapter, but that's what our focus is on tonight. Uh, and so he, he truly loved them. Well, you know how the story goes. Mary and Lazarus get sick. They send for Jesus. They say, look, our brother, the one you love, is sick. We need you to come here. We need you to come here fast. Now, I want you to remember that what Jesus could have done when he received word, because remember, he received word uh, of a centurion's daughter dying one time. And when he received word, he said, go your way, your daughter's whole. Uh, and he, he, so he could have healed when he received the word. Uh, but he, he didn't do that. Uh, instead, the Bible says, not only did he not take off to go to Lazarus to heal him, uh, but the Bible says that he delayed that much longer. He delayed two more days before he even decided to go on to Mary and Martha's. Now listen, I, I've got some news for you. Uh, if I call 911, I'm kind of expecting them to come within minutes. Um, uh, particularly since I'm near a station. Uh, I'm not wanting them to show up in a couple of hours, and I'm certainly not wanting them to show up in a couple of days, or I would not have called 911 to begin with. So the purpose of 911 is, is like, hurry, get here, I need help, I need help now. And so Mary and Martha had sent out this 911, but instead Jesus just stayed there and hung out for a few days. And in the meantime, Lazarus dies. So this brother of Mary and Martha who is so close uh, to Jesus and so close to his sisters, he got sick and Jesus delayed uh, and then he died. And so here's Mary and Martha and here's Jesus. He shows up. He's four days late. Now there's some commentary on that and it suggests that Jesus waited four days because Jewish tradition of the time suggested that when someone dies, the spirit hovers over the body for about three days and then it departs uh, and that Jesus knew this and so he didn't want to go raise Lazarus too quick because the Jews would say, oh, his spirit was hovering over his body and, uh, and entered back into his body and he, he revived or resurrected so it couldn't have been a miracle from Jesus. It just happened because the spirit was over the body. Uh, and so some commentators say that's why Jesus waited four days uh, to get past this Jewish tradition and this Jewish lore so that when he shows up to work a miracle, folks would know that it was a miracle from the Lord. 
But what happened is, and I was thinking about Sunday as I was studying this, here's Mary and Martha, and they're holding on, and they're holding on. They're checking the fever and the temperature of Lazarus, and the temperature, his fever is getting higher, and it's getting higher. Uh, he's getting weaker and weaker, and he finally stops eating, and he finally stops drinking water, and they know that after he stops drinking water that death is, is, is very soon around the corner. They didn't have IVs back in those days. They had their own forms of, of medicine, off, often naturalistic uh, types of, uh, uh, of, of medicines and things like that, but they had done all that they could do while they watched their brother wither away until he eventually died and was gone. Oh, I was thinking about Sunday. I was thinking about how Mary and Martha, there they are. And they're watching this, well, it's a person, not a thing, but they're watching this person that they love so much slip out of their hands and they can't do anything about it. And the person slips away and slips away and slips away until the individual is gone. And not just gone, but dead. And as try as they might, put water on him, cool him down, carry him to a stream. Whatever they had to do to try to revive him and heal him, they probably went to all lengths to save that brother only to find out that Jesus didn't show up, that Jesus did not speak a word of healing from a distance and from miles away, but he delayed until Lazarus actually died. And he could do nothing about it. And boy, I want to tell you something. Not only are there people who die out of our lives, and by the way, you need to understand something here. Now remember, the journey of faith, that's what I'm speaking on. You've got to remember that everything that you go through, everything that happens to you as a child of God, it's part of the journey that God has A, either made to happen, or God has B, He's allowed it to come into your life. Because God's got a greater purpose for you. And so you've got to remember that any time a relationship, a relationship slips out of your hands and somebody dies to you, so to speak, they walk away from you or they walk out of your life or whatever the case may be, you've got to see that God's doing a work in your life by allowing that to happen. God's got a greater purpose for you. And here's the thing. God never, and sometimes it's things. Sometimes there's things that die off in our lives that we can't hold on to. Maybe it's a career. Maybe it's a dream. Maybe it's an ambition. Maybe it's a certain school we want to go to or whatever. And, and we watch that dream or that vision or we watch that, that thing. We watch it die and slowly slip away from us. What you've got to keep in your mind is this, is that any time that happens in our lives as believers, that is God doing a work in our life, and God has a greater purpose in mind for you. And so we've got to get the faith perspective on this and understand that if God kills things off in our life, or if, or if there are people who die out of our lives, and I don't mean literal physical death, but if God's relationships die in our life, it's because God's doing a bigger work in us and through us. We've got to look at everything in life through eyes of faith and ask yourself, how does this fit in my journey of faith? Because God's leading me, God's guiding me, God's molding me, God's shaping me. I don't know what God's doing. I don't like it. It hurts. It makes me feel bad. It's terrible. It's tragic. I'll weep for days and nights or weeks like Mary and Martha have done. But God is doing a work bigger than I can see and we have got to trust Him. And we've got to know that any time that events or circumstances take place in our life, it's God doing a greater work and has a greater purpose in our life than where we've been at. Are you with me? Whew. We was about to go home on that one. Good. Somebody's with me. I think it was Gavin. Thank you, Gavin. You just felt sorry for me, man. You're like that poor fool's up there. Nobody's with them. But I'll say amen and make them feel a little better. So it's, all, it's, so it's all about faith. But now listen what happens here. So Mary and Martha, I, I know for two days, they've called 911. And so they're probably wondering, where, where is he at? What, what's going on? I mean, he could have caught the nearest Donkey Express and been here in eight hours. Where is Jesus? 
Why is he not here? Where's the Lord? We, we have fed this man in our house. We believe he's the Messiah. We've worshipped at his feet. We've taken care of him many, many times. He's family to us. He's so close to us. Where is he at? Does he not remember all that we have done for him? Does he not remember all that we have sacrificed for him? Does he not remember the distance we have went for him? Does he not remember how we've ministered in his name? And, and, and then here he is in my time of need and he's nowhere to be found. And this is where if you remember that Jesus decides, okay, we're going to head to Mary and Martha's and this is where some of the disciples say, listen, it's no good to go now. I mean, Lazarus is dead and he's been dead four days. And that there's no need to even go there. Uh, and, and by then there had been people gathering together. A crowd was building because they had heard of this news that Jesus has been called for and he didn't show up. And then Jesus makes this statement uh, found over in verse 15 in John chapter 11. And here's what he says. Somebody, well, well the Lord, he, first he tells his disciples, and here's some of that humor of Jesus. Remember, I told you about the humor of Jesus in recent weeks, how he's real dry, but he's, he's kind of witty and, and funny, but it's just a dry humor. And so he says, hey, let's go. And he's like, well, we don't need to go because Lazarus is dead. He said, no. He said, uh, he said La our friend Lazarus is asleep. Because remember the Lord in the Bible only speaks of believers as having go to sleep. They don't say, it doesn't speak of the believers dying. So he says, our friend Lazarus is asleep and I'm going to go and I'm going to wake him up. Now Jesus is speaking of the greater thing. He's speaking of resurrection. He knows, of course, Lazarus is dead. And the disciples are like, Lord, we, uh, we just had a committee meeting. We don't think you really understand what's going on here. But Lazarus is not taking a Sunday afternoon nap. Lazarus is kind of, he's croaked. And uh, so we don't think waking him up is going to work on this. And so Jesus looks at them and he said, listen, come here, listen. Lazarus is dead. He wants them to know, I know he's dead. But he's a believer. He's asleep. I'm about to raise him up. Uh, and so... They, they start to make this journey uh, to go to where Lazarus is at. And, and, uh, and, and the Lord says this in verse 15, and then he says this. So he says, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Now watch this. So you have watched things slip out of your life. We're right back on Sunday. This is bled right into it. You have watched things die out of your life. People die out of your life. You've watched things slip away. You couldn't stop it. You asked Jesus to stop it, and he didn't stop it. And so what's the deal here? And then on top of it all, the Lord says, Hey, I'm glad for your sake. I'm glad for your sake that I was not there. In other words, what he was saying was, I'm glad I didn't show up when you called for me. Because now Lazarus has died. Watch this though. And what Jesus was saying is this. He said, I didn't show up so that you may believe. Remember, that's the purpose of John. The whole purpose of the book of John, the gospel of John, is so that you'll believe, so that you'll believe. And that word is used over and over and over in the gospel of John. All the miracles are so that you will believe, so that you will believe, so that you will believe. Let me ask you something. If Jesus come to your rescue every time you dialed 911, every single time you stumped your toe, every single time that you bumped your knee, every time you bit your tongue, Every time that you dropped a bottle of water in the kitchen, if he come to your rescue every time you called his name, then you really would not believe in miracles, would you? And your faith really would not be much, would it? And so Jesus says, I, I'm glad for your sake I didn't go because I'm about to work a greater miracle here. And you're going to believe when you see this miracle. And see, so he's writing about this. He's writing about this, and it's recorded in Scripture so you and I can believe. So in our times when things have slipped away, and we've cried and called on Jesus and nothing, nothing. Like, I hear these preachers, and I'm one of them. Uh, it crossed my mind tonight, and it crossed my mind Sunday morning, actually. But uh, I hear these preachers, and my, I'm, like I said, I'm one of them, so I'll just say myself. But I believe fully that if God's done something for you this week and God's answered prayers in your life, I believe you ought to grab the microphone and you ought to say, I just thank the Lord tonight or I thank the Lord this morning because 
I went through something tough this week, but the Lord answered prayers. The Lord met my needs. The Lord worked a miracle in my life. I believe if God answers prayers in your life and God works, I think you ought to grab a microphone and you ought to just tell people about it. That's what I believe. Well, truth to be known, about anybody can do that. My question is, what do you do when he doesn't answer your prayers? What do I say when he doesn't come when I need him? Uh, 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 how, do I, how do I even praise him? How do I shout uh, when he's not been to my aid when I thought he ought to be there? I don't need help with what to say or what to do when he's answered prayers. I already know that. I kind of got that figured out. But I need to know what to say when he doesn't come through. I need to know what to, what to say and do when heaven is silent. That's kind of where I need him at. Uh, and, so, uh, and so heaven was silent for Mary and Martha. And they needed Jesus. And Jesus wants his disciples to know, listen, for your sake I'm glad I was not there. I come late because I'm getting ready to do a miracle. I come late because I wanted you to, I wanted you to come to the point of desperation. I wanted you to come to the point of necessity. See, as long as Lazarus was sick, they didn't really need Jesus. Because it was possible for them to do things to make Lazarus better. The things they did didn't. Lazarus died, and then they can do nothing. And then in their mind, it's all over. I can't help but to notice that when Jesus shows up, he, uh, uh, the Bible says that uh, as we read the text, the Bible says that Martha uh, went in and, and she called for her sister Mary, that Martha, uh, she run out, uh, met Jesus, assured Jesus that she had faith in him and believed that, that, that he could resurrect uh, anyone that he chooses to resurrect. Uh, and then she goes back in to get Mary because Mary was pouting. Uh, Mary was mad. Mary was upset. And Mary decided, though, even though she heard Jesus was outside, she was going to stay in the house. Boy, isn't that just like us, though, really? I mean, we come to a place in the journey of faith, this bump in the road. Maybe it's not just a bump. Maybe it's a big hole we sink our car in. And, and so we just decide that when Jesus shows up, we're just going to pout. You know what? That's the nature of mankind. That, that was, the, that was the, the nature of the children of Israel, and it's my nature, and it's, and it's your nature. Uh, but, but Martha runs in the house, and she goes in, and here's what she says to, to, uh, uh, to Mary as she runs in the house. She says, the master has come, and he calls for you. Listen, let me just say this. When you tune into a, a, a Liberty Live broadcast, if you're watching it on YouTube six months from today's date, and you come to church, and there's a word out of God's word given. Then you need to know, and I need to know, that we're blessed because the master has come and he calls for you. You didn't just come tonight just to show up and be faithful and check off your little Wednesday night list that you made it to church on this night. I hope you didn't. I hope you didn't come just to see what somebody else was wearing or not wearing or see who was here or not here. But I, I hope you come knowing that, that the Master has called. He's come and He's called for you and for me. So Martha goes in and she brings Mary out. And, and, uh, and they come out and you kind of know how the story progresses. Uh, you, you know that, that Jesus then says, okay, Take me to where Lazarus is at. Uh, he, goes through, he goes through another great I am statement. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he, 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 he talks about that for just a moment. Uh, we then find in this text as we, as we uh, read along uh, that uh, Mary and Martha is weeping. Uh, there's Jews around her that are weeping. It's grieving Jesus because he has shown up and he has come as resurrection and life, he has preached that, and now people are still weeping. And the Bible says he groans in, spirit, in his spirit. In other words, it upset him. 
It, it upset him that here he is the Messiah, the resurrection and the life. He's preached that just then to them in just a very short sermon. Uh, and yet they're full of unbelief. They're doubting. Now watch. I'm going to finish right now. Girls, come to the piano. And so he says, okay, I want you to do this. I want you to show me where they have laid him. Show me. Hey, you can sing whatever you feel led to do, but that last song y'all sung would probably be okay tonight. It would be appropriate, I believe. But whatever God puts on your heart, girls. And don't ask me when I get home, why did I confuse you? Because I said, do whatever the Lord lays on your heart, okay? So, so Jesus says this. He says, show me where you laid him. So they go to the tomb and they're like, right here it is. Now watch this, watch this, watch. And by the way, we do this all the time at home. So they're used to this. I'm used to them ragging me. You know, it's, 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 it's the way it rolls. And if you're, if you're so serious at your house, I'm sorry for you and I will pray for you, but we're not. So, the Lord, so keep, let's bring this into perspective now. Mary and Martha needed Jesus, critical time in their life. Jesus didn't show up. And when he comes, he's, he's late. He's too late. From the human perspective. Things had slipped away. Out of their life. They tried their best. To keep Lazarus. And even as hard as they tried. It, he slipped away. They didn't know. That God had a greater purpose in mind. In fact. An old preacher said that. That Lazarus died for Jesus. Now stay with me here. Don't, don't lose me. And go on a theological tangent. But an old preacher said that Lazarus died for Jesus so that Jesus could die for him because what you need to know happens in John 11 is this. Because Lazarus died and Jesus shows up and calls him out of the grave. It was from that point on. Go read it in John 11. It's at the end of John 11. At that, from that miracle on, the Jews began a plot of how to kill Jesus. And so the old preacher said, Lazarus died for Jesus so that Jesus could die for Lazarus. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Lazarus went through what he went through. Mary and Martha went through what they went through. And it initiated this plan to get Jesus nailed to a tree on the cross and to crucify him, which really brought salvation to all of mankind. But they needed Jesus because things were slipping. Jesus was late, he didn't show up, and Jesus himself said, I'm glad I didn't show up because I'm about to do a miracle and many will believe when they see this miracle. And so he goes, they go to the graveside of the cemetery and he says, show me where they laid him. Show me where your heart quit. Show me where you give up at. I imagine on that bedside, as Lazarus is sick and dying, they were working, and they were working, and they were working. And they were laboring, and they were laboring, and they were laboring. They were doing everything they could do. Maybe they were sending for doctors, and sending for more doctors, and sending for more doctors. And maybe they were giving this medicine, or that medicine, or this, or doing this, or doing that. And doing all the things that modern science allowed them to do in that day, trying to make Lazarus live. They'd done all that they could do, and finally Lazarus died. And now nothing. And so Jesus goes, he says, show me where they laid him. In other words, show me where you give up at. Show me where you threw in the towel. Show me where you quit. Show me where your heart was broke. Show me where, uh, show me where you decided that it just wasn't worth it anymore. Take me to that place and show me. And then I'm going to show you something. And here's what the Lord showed them. He wanted them to take him where they had laid Lazarus. Where they had quit, where they'd give up, where they'd thrown it all in. Because what the Lord does next is this. He shows them that, that where you end is where he just begins. Are you with me? 
Yeah. Until you've come to the end of a thing, the Lord can't work. And see, it wouldn't have been... Hang on just a minute. I'm having a moment here. The Lord wanted them to see. As long as Lazarus was alive and you kind of could fix things or patch things up or make things a little better for the moment, there was no room for a faith or a miracle. But you had to come to the end of it. You had to come to a place where you throw in the towel, where you quit, where you give up, where you back up, where you question God, where you're mad at God. You ever been in that place? You can act holy if you want to tonight, but I have been. I've literally, as Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why? I've done that, but I shook my fist to heaven and said, God, why? Why did you let this happen? Why did you let that happen? It should have never happened, Lord. But see, the Lord lets us come to these places. Remember, it's about the journey. Because He's always doing a greater purpose in our life. He's always got a greater purpose in our life. And so He lets you come to the end of that thing. And He wants you to show Him, where did you quit at? Where did you lay it down at? Where did you fly the white flag at? Where did you get mad at me at? Take me and show me. Because when you show me where you laid it all down at, I'm going to show you where I pick it up and I just begin working in your life. And he says, hey, roll back the stone. And you know what they said? They said, Lord, you got to remember, now he's been dead four days, Lord. In four days, the body decomposes. And Lord, it stinks. It stinks. He says, roll back that stone. You know what he was saying there? He was saying, I can handle all your stinky stuff. Stay with me. I I can handle all the bad things in you. I can handle all the things in you that's not good. I can deal with all that. I, I can deal with it. I can work miracles. If there's a place where you laid it down, if there's a place where you've quit, if there's a place you've been mad, if there's a place where you flew up the white flag because I didn't do what you think I needed to do or wasn't there when you think I needed to be there, you take me and you show me that place. And when you show me that place, you're going to show me all of that bad stuff inside of you. You're going to show me all that stinky stuff inside of you. But I can handle it, the Lord says. And so he said, roll back that stone. And when they roll back that stone, now keep in mind the Lord once again should have the Lord once again could have just prayed in his heart, said, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, Lazarus, be alive. But he didn't do that. He wanted everybody to hear. And he wanted everybody to know that he was going to work this miracle. And so he, he, he screamed with a loud voice. Lazarus come forth and by the way that's three times and I'm going to come back to this in a second that's three times in scripture that the Lord had a shout and that shout identified with the resurrection this is one of three times the first in scripture And so he shout excuse me he shouts everybody standing around and it's the moment Lazarus comes out. He doesn't come walking out. Remember, he's bound hand and foot in sackcloth. They buried the man. And so here he comes. And all of a sudden, everybody can hear coming out of that tomb or out of that cave. They can hear him who was once dead making some noise. They can hear him who was once dead moving toward the door. They can hear him who was once dead making his way out from the darkness of death and decay into the light, into resurrection life. And and so the Lord brought him out. And we see that where they took Jesus when he said, where's the spot you laid him? And they said, well, right here, here it is. 
The Lord wanted to see it. And so what he wants of us is, is to confess to him, Lord, this is where I'm at. It's not a good place. I'm hurting. I'm heartbroken. I don't know why you didn't help. I don't know why you didn't do this or why you didn't do that. I've been mad. I've been angry. I've been tore up. And this is where I am, Lord. Right here is where it's at. And the Lord is as if he said, okay. If you're at the end of yourself and you've done all you can do, and it's still not enough and it never is, and the Lord knows that, then let me take over. And let me do what you couldn't do. Let me do what the doctors couldn't do. Let me do what no man could do. Let me do what you just so insignificantly thought I would do. And that would be to show up and and heal, uh, and heal him. But I had it in my mind to do something greater than just heal him of a sickness. I had it in my mind to raise him up. So if God's doing something in your life, you're in this event or this circumstance, then you need to know God's working a greater purpose in your life. I don't know who you are or where you're at, but faith recognizes that I'm on this journey and that everything that happens to me, around me, or with me, it's because God is leading me to a greater purpose. That's what happened here. God used this situation to initiate a plan to crucify Jesus, to get him to a place called Calvary where he died for me and for all of mankind and all of you. If you need scripture to back this up, if you've got that Joel scripture, at least load that up. If you need scripture to back this up, you need to listen. I love this passage. Joel said this, This is a promise. And I will restore to you the years. See, some of you have got things you've dealt with for years. And my my heart breaks for you. It really does. But, But the Lord said, I will restore to you the years, not the days, not the weeks, not the months. It's pretty bad if over a series of months... You've watched things slip away and die. But when it's been years, the Lord still makes this promise. I'll restore to you the years that the locust has eaten and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, a great army which I sent among you. The Lord says this. Let me paraphrase that. I'll give you back all you ever lost. And more. I'm not going to give you back what you lost, but I'll give you back more than you ever lost. And then there'll be a day when you won't even think about what slipped out of your hands. But you'll remember the miracle that I worked in you. See, this has been a setup in your life. I don't know where you're at, what's going on, but it's been a setup. The Lord has set you up. He has set you up to come to a place where you can't do anything else. So he, can set, he, so he can step in and He can begin where you ended. And so some of you, somewhere in your life, you've come to the end of yourself. You've come to the end of trying. You've come to the end of praying. You've come to the end of fighting this thing. And now you just don't know what to do anymore. Well, the Lord says, show me where you laid it. Because where you laid it down is where I'm going to pick it up. As Martha told Mary, the Lord's come for you and He calls for you. So He calls for you tonight. Don't miss tonight, please, because the way this lays out and plays out from Sunday to tonight in John 11, I couldn't have planned this. Don't miss the fact tonight that the Lord's calling you. This could be your miracle where the Lord restores to you the years 
the years. More than likely, if you've got something you've been dealing with for days, weeks, or months, it's really greater than that. It probably goes back for some years. This song, I think it says it best if y'all will play that on the screen as they sing it. It really says things the best. It's talking about bringing him your crowns, but what about bringing him your pain, your disappointment, your heartache, bringing him your unbelief? I don't know about you, but I want to tell you, I, I, I have an easy time believing in a miracle for you. But when it comes to me, I have a hard time believing in one. But I'll have full faith, faith that will move mountains, that God will work a miracle in your life. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you're sitting there saying, well, I believe it for them, preacher, or I believe it for her, or I believe it for him. But it just can't be for me. I'm going to tell you, I believe it for you. And I know the Lord's come. And he's calling for you. He wants you to come. Show him where you laid it. Show him where you threw in the towel and quit. So he can show you that when you finally quit, you finally give up. He's going to step in and take over. He's going to do miracles. Stand, girls, sing. Give Him the glory. Even in your brokenness, even in your pain, come. Come quick.